Okay, let's talk about infective endocarditis next. Um, what is it and who can get it? Basically, infective endocarditis is an inflammation that involves the inner layer of your heart, the endocarditis, right? So endo, we remember, says inner, carditis, inflammation of the heart, right? So just there in that word, we know that it's infective, so infection of the inner layer of the heart that causes inflammation. Okay, um, it's usually the result of an infectious organism of some kind. It's considered um, an autoimmune response. Um, a lot of clients that have had rheumatic carditis or rheumatic fever or something in the past, a lot of times those um, issues that remain following the rheumatic carditis um, can then sometimes leave the patient a lot more prone to developing infective endocarditis later down the road. Because remember with uh, rheumatic carditis, the patient has those um, vegetations that are forming on those valves, right? And so with those vegetations, unless they have a valve replacement or something, there's a lot of the deep pocket, pockets within those vegetations where other uh, microorganisms can lodge, and then it could end up causing, you know, more ex ex extensive infection within the heart. So people who are also in set, uh, susceptible include people who have non-rheumatic valve disease, so any kind of disease that's not associated with rheumatic fever um, that's affecting the valves. Um, artificial heart valves, those people are at risk as well. Um, people who have repaired congenital defects within their heart. A prolapsed mitral valve, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which we'll learn about later on. Those people are also at risk for developing infective endocarditis. Um, IV drug users, patients with central venous catheters, so like central lines, you've probably heard of those. Um, those people have a higher chance of getting infective endocarditis. And that's just because the, these people have um, higher incidence of microorganisms entering their bloodstream at all times, and then our bloodstream travels throughout our body and goes through our heart, and a lot of times those infections can lodge within the endocardium um, and cause problems. So most commonly it's caused by Streptococcus viridians or Staphylococcus aureus, okay, so Strep viridians or Staph A. All right. The pathogens enter the bloodstream usually, you know, by some kind of invasive procedure, whether it's been a surgery, IV drug use, a central line, um, or something that's been latent within the system for a while. Um, and a lot of times it also involves procedures that involve your mucous membrane. So remember with rheumatic carditis, we told these patients, or we have learned to educate these patients, that they need to take a prophylactic antibiotic every time they go get a procedure done of any kind, including dental work. Well, remember we said with the dental work, they're messing with your mucous membranes, and you have tons of capillaries in those areas. And so if they're not taking those prophylactic antibiotics, they could end up get, developing infective endocarditis as a result of dental procedures because they're already susceptible to more infection. Does that make sense? If you have a question about this, make sure you let me know. All right. Um, people who have prolonged IV therapy, cardiac pacemakers, um, catheters, Foley insertions, people with tracheostomies, all of these just give so much more exposure to microorganisms, bacteria, and everything than you or I would in a normal situation. Anyone can contract infecto, inter, infective endocarditis, but people who have a history of rheumatic carditis, like we said, they're just so much more susceptible. And people who have, you know, all of these more invasive tubes and procedures, they, it just gives them more opportunities of um, coming in contact with, um, you know, microorganisms that might cause this disorder. Um, so the microorganisms, they migrate um, to the endocardial surface, that endocardium surface. I um, mean, they attach themselves to those vegetation that sur surround those heart valves. Remember we said those things that grow? They bury themselves within those masses. And then it makes it, I mean, nearly impossible to destroy these infections with antibiotics. Because think about when you give somebody antibiotics, you usually give it in a vein in the arm, right? So it's traveling throughout the body. Eventually it'll go through the heart because that's just how our blood works, right? Eventually it'll all go through the heart. So by the time it gets there, typically it's pretty dilute. And within these little vegetations, I mean, I know I keep showing you my little deformed knuckle here, but um, these microorganisms are getting lodged in these grooves within the vegetation. So by the time those antibiotics get through, they usually will just wash right over it, and it's not going to get way down into those grooves and kill the bacteria that's in there. Does that make sense? So it's really, really hard to um, correct this once it happens. So really our best bet is to try to prevent it.
if at all possible. Our left side of the heart is usually more affected than the right side, typically because the mitral valve is the one that develops those um, vegetation more likely. Um, and so typically, you know, your left side is going to be more affected just because that's where your mitral valve is. The vegetation can break off and they form clots um, that can interfere with your blood supply anywhere, can cause a heart attack, can cause a stroke, can cause a DVT. It's very dangerous. So the vegetations cause weakening of the valve's leaflets. That's what we call leaflets. So that's what they're supposed to look like, little sweet leaves, right? But the vegetations make them short, hard, and thick. So it causes weakening of those. Um, and then the weakened valves, they leak blood through it because it doesn't have that stop gate like it's supposed to. And then the heart has diminished it um, in its ability to act as a pump to pump that blood through. Because if the blood's rushing backwards and forwards instead of just forwards, mm -hmm. then the blood supply is compromised. You end up having heart failure. The vegetation can break off. They can become emboli. They can obstruct your blood flow. And worst case scenario, the patient can die. So it's very, very important that we catch this um, in plenty of time. Um, the signs and symptoms. A lot, of, um, a lot of times within the acute onset, which is less than a week after the patient has developed infective endocarditis, you're probably just going to notice some basic things like fever and chills, muscle aches, joint pain, and those are pretty broad signs and symptoms. So we don't really know what it is at this point, and a lot of times we're not going to jump to the conclusion that they have infective endocarditis. A lot of times we're going to think, oh, it's just a cold, or they have the flu, or something like that. Um, but then later on, as it keeps progressing, um, we can have subacute onset, which means within weeks and months, a lot of times the symptoms become more vague and really strange. They end up having severe headaches. They feel really just fatigued and just not, they don't feel well, right? And that's what they'll tell you. I just don't feel right. I don't know what is wrong with me. I just don't feel right. And as it progresses, you start noticing the more hallmark and specific signs and symptoms, okay? So these are the ones that you really need to know that are specific with infective endocarditis. They, had, they develop ostler nodes, and these are painful nodes on their fingers and toes, okay? This first picture here is the ostler nodes, all right? Um, and then they can develop splinter hemorrhages. You see this here? on these fingernails. They look like splintering, but it's hemorrhages right underneath the fingernail beds. Um, they can have Janeway lesions. I don't have a picture of that, but they're small painless lesions that are on um, their hands. They just look really strange. And then Roth spots. It's white areas um, in the retina. See this right here? White areas in the retina that are surrounded by hemorrhage. Okay, so you see these bloody patches all around. All right. Um, they also can have petechiae. See this? It's red rash petechiae, but it's, it appears really purpley as well um, whenever it is true petechiae. Um, and then they're just really weak. They don't feel like eating. And then worst case scenario, they develop these emboli that can then cause a stroke, renal failure, pulmonary, pulmonary emboli, or heart attack or something. All right, it's very, very serious. So anytime we start noticing these little splinter hemorrhages or the Roth spots or, you know, the petechiae, we really want to start investigating more. So how to investigate more? We've got to run the diagnostic tests, right? So with our labs, we're looking for anemia. Anemia is just um, a decreased number of red blood cells within the patient's body. Okay, so we'll draw a complete blood count a CBC, and we'll look at their red blood cell total, and then we'll look at the breakdown with their hemoglobin and hematocrit as well. And if those are all significantly decreased, then we're assuming that they have anemia. Okay? Then we just need to figure out why. We're also looking for leukocytosis. All right, I want you to break down this word as well. Whenever you hear leuco, it's talking about the white cells. Okay? And then cyto is cell, so leukocytosis. Osis means big. Okay? So like a lot more. So basically, we're looking for a an increased white blood cell count. Okay, leukocytosis. Okay, white cell osis big. Okay, um, we're also going to look at blood cultures. Those blood cultures are going to show us if any microorganisms are growing within that blood. Um, to draw blood cultures, you use specific vials. They're pretty big. Um, some places they look like bottles and they have like their bottleneck and then other places they're just like jars but they're bigger okay normally a blood tube's about that big right these are bigger okay and you've got to put um, 
a lot more blood within these, okay, and you fill up two of them, they'll send them off for culture, and usually it takes about 20, 72 hours before we get the cultures back and can really see what's grown in there. But once we get those back, we can see what microorganism has grown, and then we're able to determine the cause of the infected endocarditis. A transesophageal echo is an uh, echocardiogram that goes in through the mouth and down the esophagus, and we're able to see then um, into the heart through using the echocardiogram um, to see what's going on. And it's going to reveal vegetations, which are structurally going to be different. It's also going to show us the altered valve function, um, impaired pumping of the ventricles. You're going to be able to see that the blood is not really getting forced out the same way that it should be getting forced out. Um, to treat it, we want to give them high, high doses of IV antibiotics because we don't want it to be diluted. We want it to go straight to that heart and really get, really saturate um, those valves and wherever that um, the organisms can be dwelling. Okay, those antibiotics are going to be given around the clock for at least two to six weeks, which is a very, very long time to be on antibiotics. All right, so we really want to be watching our patients, putting them on bed rest, um, noticing. You know, if we if we see any um, degeneration in the patient's status, um, we really or you know if their patient is declining at all, we really want to notate that and report it to the physician as quickly as possible, um, because potentially they might have to have a valve replacement as a result of this disease. As a nurse, just encourage your patient to limit their activity. Um, you want to assess their weight changes. See if they have any swelling or weight gain, because um, that could indicate to us that they might have a failing heart. Um, check their vital signs regularly and really pay close attention to them because since we are dealing with the heart, their blood pressure can change on a dime. So we really, really need to know. Also their heart rate, you know, and then look at, do the, the full cardiac assessment. See if their, um, their skin tone or their um, color, you know, are they having pallor or are they red? Um, are they swelling? Are they bruising? Do they have the petechiae? Assess everything about them, okay? And make sure you write everything down because these are key parts to the investigation of seeing how we can treat the patient and what's going on with the patient. For the rest of their life, they're gonna have to be on periodic antibiotics because the patient is vulnerable to this disease for the rest of their life. This is something that they can um, get into remission from, but they do need to be aware that this is a lifetime struggle from here on out, that they need to make sure that they're taking the antibiotics and that um, they're staying on top of their health status. And as soon as you see fevers and, or anything else, we want to check them out to make sure their heart is okay. All right? Um, let's take a break and we'll come back for the next one.